Vicky's mining chat. That's good. <laughs> John, we'll see you are you able to. Yeah, let's do it. Okay, let's go. All right. Today's speaker, first time speaker on Science for the Board, is Scott Diamond. Scott received his undergraduate degrees in physics and applied mathematics from UC Berkeley. He then received a doctorate in applied physics from Stanford. Scott worked at Tektronix, then at Valve.com before happily landing at FLIR Systems, where he's been for the last 18 years. He has had a number of technical and quality roles, but has been a manager so long that his brain has turned partially to much. So that's what Scott wrote. I have found in my interactions with him that his brain is anything but mush. He's one of the brightest, sharpest people um, I've had the pleasure to work with. Great. Scott's favorite energy source is human power. In the last few years, has taken off on adventures hiking and backpacking the world, and biking, I might add. His claim to fame is once being offered a job on the spot selling shoes at a high-end running store. I did not know that. <laughs> the title of his talk is Science, Economics, and the Politics of Energy. Science, Economics, and the Politics of Energy, Dr. Scott Diamond. All right, let me start my stopwatch. Thank you, John. Uh, hi to everyone. It's fun to be on this side of the screen, I guess. And also, so I, I forwarded this invite to some friends and family who are here for the first time. So hi to you. And I hope you can, uh, hope you enjoyed tonight's talk and you join us for some of the future ones. So um, yeah, John, uh, I'm gonna try and cover this massive topic, the science, economics, and politics of energy. And I'd also yeah. like to finish it in an hour. So obviously there's, there's no way I'm gonna do this topic justice. So in the next hour, I'm gonna just kind of give the basic building blocks and, and a rudimentary understanding of some of the principles. Um, and the other thing is, uh, this, this is uh, part one of part two. I decided that, that rather than try and spread this out too much, that, that I would, uh, if you don't hate me at the end of this talk, I'll come back at a future time and talk about what, unfortunately, some of you may find the more interesting part, which is uh, renewable energy, which I know is a term that John Miller hates, but I'm, I'm not going to get into that debate right now. So uh, in the future, I'll, I'd like to talk to you about renewable energy and closely related to that uh, energy storage. Okay, well, I'm, I'm not an expert by any means on the science of energy. I, I did read this, listen to this audio book a few years ago and it was, it was very good. I do like the topic and I spent some time researching it, putting together this talk. But um, I, a number of times in this talk, you're gonna see this icon exercise for the reader. And that means that uh, either um, I didn't have time to include it in the talk or maybe more likely, I wasn't able to find the answer. So as I said, I'm, I'm not an expert in this, in this matter. And, however, I'm gonna be sharing my viewpoint at a number of places throughout this talk. And uh, I know that a number of you are rather expertise, uh, have some expertise on a number of energy topics. And I'm sure you would like to share your viewpoint as well. And uh, however, you know, I would like to finish it in under an hour. So I think we could get into a debate of these topics and it could last, um, you know, two or three hours, which none of us want. So if, if you have, you know, a brief opinion you'd like to state, then uh, go ahead. But if you want to get a debate, then, you know, actually what I'd really recommend is, is maybe you give a talk in the future. Bruce is looking for people to talk in next year and maybe you could dive into one of these topics in greater detail. Okay, um, so uh, this is the outline for my talk. This is how I planned it originally. And then I started putting the slides together and decided there was no way I was gonna cover this in the hour. So, um, so I'm, I got rid of three, three sections here, natural gas, bio and renewables. And so hopefully I can cover that in the future. And as I said, uh, you know, I, I like to talk part two about renewable energy storage. So let me start with, with uh, part one, which is introduction and my own ramblings. And so uh, as far as ramblings, I'm gonna talk about uh, two things that I love the most, backpacking and myself. Um, so as, as, as some of you know, and as Bruce was talking in the introduction, um, in 2016, I had the, the great pleasure of backpacking from, uh, on the Pacific Crest Trail from Mexico to Canada. Took me 127 days, and there is actually an energy content to this to this backpacking trip, which is why I put it in this talk. Um, 
I consumed, I figure at least 5,000 calories a day. When, when you're hiking the Pacific Crest Trail, it's fair to say you, you dream about food. You know, hikers share stories of where you get the best milkshakes and where you get the best pizzas. So calories, energy is a big part of doing the hike. And uh, on the right, you can see a picture of me as I cross the, uh, the border, uh, Oregon, California border. And I'm scruffy, disheveled, but also somewhat emaciated. I must be at least 20 pounds lighter in that photo than I am today because all the calories I consume. So in this energy talk, I'm gonna talk about energy density and calories related to the hike as one of my intros. So it turns out that there are a lot of ways to hike the Pacific Crest Trail. And I chose to ship myself food uh, at various points on the trail that I'd pick it up. It just turned out it was more convenient. and and as arduous as doing the hike was, in, in some senses, it was more difficult to get all this food together. And this is a picture of my living room the winter before. And these boxes, and these aren't all the boxes, these are, are just filled with food that I mailed myself. And so here's a picture of myself at Yosemite picking out three boxes of food uh, that I was then gonna do, I think about an eight day section at that point. And, um, and you, as you can imagine, I spent a lot of time thinking about the kind of food that I wanted to take with me and all the calories I consume. So how much energy did I consume during that hike? Well, 127 days at about 5,000 calories a day means that I consumed about 635,000 calories. And as I said, I really thought about the food I was gonna take. You're not gonna take something like uh, fresh fruit along in part because um, you know, you, you, I could never pack it in the winter and then have it survive in, in the summer but also you couldn't carry that weight in water. So instead I'm taking things like freeze dried food, oatmeal, nuts and things like that. And, and as I packed my food, I was, I was very cognizant of the energy density of the foods that I was carrying. You know, I think most of us know fat has a lot more calories per gram than proteins and carbohydrates. And so kind of, you know, the ultimate uh, for backpacking from that point is, is to eat fat, which is the opposite of when you're trying to lose weight, you want to stay away from fat. But when you're backpacking and you can carry it on your back, you want as much fat as you can. And a few years ago, so the ultimate would be this olive oil I'm showing over in the right. And a few years ago, I met a backpacker who was just, he was just going for a four day backpack, but he decided to not carry a stove and not carry a cook set and survive for four days on just eating olive oil, which, you know, I, I've, I've tried that for one meal and I can't do that. But I, so it would drive me crazy. It's not possible for me to eat olive oil for four days. But from the energy uh, density standpoint, from the efficiency standpoint, I get that, right? All right, so now I'm gonna talk about, put together a table of, uh, of different energy density for foods. So let's imagine instead of mailing myself packages of food along the way like I did, that instead I started at the Mexico border and I put a pile of all the food I was gonna consume to do 127 days of backpacking. And so I'm going to talk about the food and then the energy density of the food and how much the food weighs. So the first two are basically the same. It, it, carbohydrates and proteins both have about 4.1 calories per gram. So to do my backpacking trip, I would have had to carry about 344 pounds of carbohydrates or equivalent if I just ate protein, 344 pounds of, uh, of protein. If instead I, I used olive oil or, or fat, well, the energy density of fat is quite a bit higher. It's 9.1 calories per gram. So in that case, I'd be down to 154 pounds, which is a lot lighter, but obviously still way too much for someone to carry uh, from, from Mexico to Canada. Uh, I'm going to continue this table, and uh, we're going to enter here quite rapidly the realm of science fiction to look at ed energy sources. So the next one I want to look at is wood. Now, uh, obviously humans cannot eat wood, but some animals can, beavers, termites, and I think some, some sea creatures can eat wood. Unfortunately, wood, the energy density of wood isn't all that high, it's 4.3 calories per gram. Um, so if I carried that pile, uh, amount of wood I'd have to carry is 325 pounds, still a lot. Now, obviously if I could eat wood, you know, I could forage along the way and that would be a little bit better, but uh, as far as energy density, it's, it's not a great win. Next, let's look at coal. Now, now uh, no mammal can eat 
coal. And I don't think any animal can eat coal. I, I, I may be wrong. Maybe there's a bacteria, but I don't think so. So, so this is clearly in the realm of science fiction. These are energy sources that humans cannot consume. But if I could eat coal, the, the energy density of coal is 7.2 calories per gram. It's okay. So we'd be, I'd be carrying 195 pounds of coal as my energy source to do the backpack. Gasoline, suppose I could eat gasoline. Gasoline is 11.1 .1 calories per gram. So finally we're at, a, at, at a, a material that has greater energy density than fat. So I'd be 126 pounds, which is, uh, which is better. It would be actually pretty nice to eat gasoline because as, as we know, gas stations are available in every small town and it would be a great food source, but it's still too heavy. And as long as I'm dreaming, I'm gonna go kind of to the limit here with the next two examples. Uh, oh, I said I have one more and then I'll go to the limit. Hydrogen, so um, there are hydrogen cars and uh, you can see the energy density of hydrogen. It's actually quite high, 33.9 calories per gram. So I, as I put this table together, it's like, oh yeah, I can see why hydrogen cars make sense then. So if I could consume hydrogen and I didn't have a doer or something to put it in, I mean, if I, neglecting the weight of what I had to store it in, it'd be 41.3 pounds, which would is almost getting to the point where it's practical that you could, you could carry that for the whole hike. But okay, now I'm gonna enter kind of the, the limit. If I could consume uranium, well, look at the energy density of uranium, right? Isn't it just astounding? The energy density of uranium is six orders of magnitude higher than hydrogen. So uh, if I could eat uranium, I could have done my whole backpack and I would have carried only 33 micrograms of uranium to fuel myself for 127 days on the trail which is pretty astounding and would be great. And then um, the ultimate limit, as far as I know, is antimatter. So antimatter is three orders of magnitude higher energy density than uranium. So if I could eat antimatter, I could have done my whole backpack carrying only 29.6 nanograms of antimatter. And it turns out CERN has an antimatter factory and the web says it costs trillions of dollars per gram. So if you do the math, then for me to buy 29.6 nanograms of antimatter would have cost me $1.85 million, which is too much for me. But if I was Bill Gates and I wanted to hike the PCT and I could eat antimatter, that might actually be a pretty good way to do it. Okay, so what's the point of this, of this chart? A couple of things. First, I think a lot of us think of, of food as, as, as separate than energy sources. Really, the, you know, and many of these energy sources, we have carbon bonds that are made and we're breaking carbon bonds and that's what provides the energy. And, and carbohydrates, protein, fat, that's just you know, energy in a form that humans consume, but these are all energy sources. And the other thing that came out to me when I put this together was the energy density of uranium. You know, I mean, when I saw that energy density, it's like, you know, light bulb went off and said, wow, uh, nuclear energy. Yeah, I get it. That is an incredibly high energy density. And I could see why, the, why there's such a draw for that. Okay, so a few more just kind of background information in this introduction. Um, I'm gonna talk about power scales here. So one watt. One watt is one joule per second. And you know, I have an iPhone, uh, iPhone 10. And if I hold this iPhone 10 and I raise it up 52 centimeters in Earth's gravity, and if I do it once every second, that is one watt of energy, which actually when you think of it that way, I think that's, that's a fair amount of energy. If I had to do that once every second uh, continuously, uh, that's one watt of energy. 100 watt light bulb, I think most of us are familiar with old uh, light bulbs and so uh, we know what 100 watts is. 11 kilowatts, 11 kilowatts is the uh, average total energy that's, that's for transportation, electricity, heating, all that stuff per person in the United States consumes 11 kilowatts. And that's quite a bit higher than the world average which is 2.5 kilowatts. Next, let's look at a uh, typical coal or nuclear power plant. That's one gigawatt. And then Three Gorges, the world largest power hydro plant in China is 22 gigawatts. Total energy consumption by, in the world is 18 terawatts. And then I'm ending here with how much energy is there in the sunlight that hits the earth? Well, it's an astounding 173,000 terawatts of energy from the sun. 
So in the last example, you know, I, I kind of, you know, the light bulb for me was nuclear energy. And in this one, I kind of get, oh, solar power. Yeah, I get it. There's a lot of energy out there that's available to us. Okay, so now let's look at um, kind of uh, energy consumption over time. And this chart is showing United States from 1776 to 2014. And there are a few points to make here. Uh, first, for, for many years, of course, the other than human or animal power, you know, the energy source was wood. And so, you know, in the 1970s, we talked about an energy crisis, right? And I'd argue in the 1970s, we never had an energy crisis. There were a lot of sources of energy. Maybe there was an economic crisis of the price of the energy, but there wasn't a shortage of energy. But, you know, if you're in the 1800s and your only energy source was wood and you had to go, you could see cleaning out the forests and running out of wood, you would have really had an energy crisis in that case. The other thing is the importance of coal. coal. Coal started being used in 1850, and you see for like 60 or 70 years, coal was it. That was the only energy source that was used. And um, I think at around World War I is when battleships made the, the switch from coal-fired ships to diesel-powered. And then after about 1910 or 1920, then there are a bunch of energy sources. And I'm going to show that instead. And I've got a, a pie chart in the next slide. So this is showing energy consumption in the United States. And um, so and today, I'm going to talk about these first three. Coal, 11%. Nuclear power, 8%. Petroleum, 37%. Natural gas, 32%, which I'm not going to talk about today. And then, you know, the small part of this slice is renewable energy. Renewable energy is only 11%. And then that's further subdivided. So, for example, solar is 9% of 11%. So, about, we, in the United States, about 1% of energy comes from solar and from wind, about 2.5%. So, it's really not that significant at this point. Now, I think we all believe that over time, eventually, fossil fuels will, will not be used and these, this will be the dominant source of energy, but at this point, it's not a lot. The other thing that's going on is that our energy consumption is increasing dramatically, right? So, this chart is showing global energy consumption from 1800 to 2019. And obviously, the, the rate that curve is increasing is amazing, right? As the, as the rest of the world is consuming more and more energy. And that does beg the question of, you know, I said in the 1970s, we really didn't have an energy crisis. Could we have an energy crisis in the year 2050 or 2100 with how our energy use is increasing? Perhaps. Now, I, I think economics will drive us to, to either find ways of conserving or, or find more energy sources, but clearly there's a trend where it's going up quite a bit. Okay, so that's it for the introduction, and let me see how I'm doing on time here. Uh, we're doing good. All right, so now I'm going to talk about um, coal, petroleum, and nuclear, and for each of these I'm going to talk about, I'm going to say, where does that energy source come from? How much of it do we have? What do, you, what do we use this energy for? And then I'm really gonna express my opinion, mostly my viewpoint of what's the future like. Okay, so let's start on coal. Um, this is an artist rendering of, of the appropriately named Carboniferous period. I really like this picture. I mean, to me, it's really exotic and interesting. The backpacker and me would love to go back there, I think. Probably once I got there, I wouldn't like it that much. But so this this is a uh, time in Earth's history that spanned 60 million years, from 360 to 300 million years ago. You know, and, and, you know that alone I think is pretty interesting. You, you realize Homo sapiens have only been on Earth about 300,000 years, and so this coal that we're harvesting, you know, it formed over 60 million years that this took to form this coal. And you know, and like we only started using coal for well, Homo sapiens only 300,000 years. And we've only used coal since 1850, right? So it's kind of neat that we're extracting this. We're, we're taking this deposit that took 60 million years to, uh, to create. So Earth at that time was, the conditions were just right, that it was mostly lakes and giant swamps, like this picture is showing. Turns out there was a greater oxygen content in the Earth at that time. It was 35% versus 21% now, which I read allowed for some unusual creatures such as giant insects, 
dragonflies uh, about a foot and a half across. Now, I personally have this thing, I really don't like bugs. So as enhancing as en entrancing as this picture looks and I could go hiking there, I think I would really have a problem with the giant insects. So uh, these trees and plants uh, fell down and um, the, they fell down into swampy water. And, uh, and if they're in swampy water, there, there isn't oxygen, and so that would stop them from decaying. And that's really key. If, if a tree falls in the woods now, we're not gonna end up with coal. The, the joke is when the tree falls in the woods now, the, the animals have a party because there are all these animals that eat the, the trees and they would digest it and so it, it would decay. But back then it would fall into the swampy, swampy water. And furthermore, scientists believe that perhaps the bacteria and fungi back then 300 million years ago had not evolved to the point that they could digest wood. So all this carbon energy, this photosynthesis that made these carbon bonds did not degrade, did not decay. Instead, this matter got compressed down and then got buried by other layers and pushed down into the earth. And, and of course, we ended up with uh, coal seams, like I'm showing this picture that we're familiar with, and then we then mine these coal seams, right? This is this is a nice picture, but I think this isn't new to anyone. That's what happens with coal. All right, so where is uh, where is coal found in the world? I, I really like this map here. This is showing uh, where the coal deposits are. So the coal deposits are in the United States, Canada, Russia, and Australia. A few years ago, I heard the claim that U.S. was the Saudi Arabia of coal. And to me, that sounded like a pretty... Um, pretty extravagant claim, but it turns out it's true. And the rationale is that Saudi Arabia in petroleum, Saudi Arabia has 20% of the world's supply of petroleum. Well, for coal, the United States is 26.8% of the world's supply of coal. So I think it's fair to say that the United States is the Saudi Arabia of coal. How long will that coal last? Well, you know, there's, this talk is called the science, politics, and economics of energy. And so economics plays a big role in this, and you get into what's economically recoverable. But recoverable reserves at mines that are operating today and producing, say, we have about 20 years of coal. Well, that's just the mines that are producing today. We really think that the coal reserves, they're not all economical, that the coal reserves would last 357 years. That's at least one estimate, right? So uh, coal may have a lot of issues, but scarcity is not one of the issues with coal. What do we, what do we use the coal for? In a word, electricity. I mean, you can see the pie chart here. Electricity is 68%. I remember as kids seeing pictures of a steel, uh, steel plant and you'd see you know, uh, molten steel. So there's some use there, but really when you think of coal energy, think of electricity. Any future for coal? Okay, so this is the point in the talk where, where I get to share my viewpoint. Um, so there are 600 electrical plants in the United States. 20% of the world's energy uh, comes from coal and 48% of the world's electricity comes from coal. However, coal is dirty. Coal is very dirty. Coal is dirty in the mining, in the transporting, in the washing and the burning. All of these are dirty. Coal releases more carbon dioxide per joule of energy than any other energy source. There are numerous exceptions to environmental regulations in the United States. So many of these coal electricity plants in the US are very dirty and bad for our environment. Um, I don't know how, how many of you have heard of clean coal. I mean, it sounds great, you know, it sounds like nirvana, right? That's what we want. We want to have clean coal. Well, Clean coal, uh, there are several methods, but the primary ones are washing of coal before you burn it. There's CO2 absorption, which is kind of this chart I'm showing to the right, and there's oxygen fuel consumption. You know, however, let, let's say you absorb the, coal, the CO2, which is great. It doesn't go in the atmosphere. Now, what do you do with the CO2, right? And I'm showing down here a picture of a, a coal-powered station. And now you've got the CO2 and you've got to send it somewhere. And so you've got to put in some kind of pipeline. Maybe you bury it under the ground in an aquifer or best case scenario, 
there's an oil well nearby and they need assistance getting the oil out. And so you're gonna use the CO2 and you're gonna pump it down in this oil well and that pressure of the CO2 will force, force the oil out. And so you kind of get a double use for that. And there is a plant in Texas that's, that's trying to do this. There is a well nearby, but in general, you'd have to, you might have to transport that CO2 tens of miles, hundreds of miles. Um, all all the, the apparatus for the CO2 absorption costs a lot of money. So, okay, my, my opinion is clean coal is not economically viable. There are other sources that are far more economically viable. So what does the future coal consumption look like? Uh, I pulled this chart here. This shows uh, historic and future. We're, sh we're here at 2020 at this point, and it does look, unfortunately, that coal consumption is going to increase for at least next decade. The main contributors to that are China and India. You can see China in red here is going to continue to increase the amount of coal they're going to use. But somewhere around 2030, we'll reach peak coal, and at that point, the amount of coal will decrease. So China, 70% of their energy comes from coal, which is not great. But, you know, and Trump had this big thing about, you know, rescuing the coal workers and resurgence of the coal industry. But, you know, there's certain things he, he, he can't change, right? I mean, we've already found the large, easy, big coal deposits. The less are less economically viable. And the other economic factor that's going on here is natural gas. Natural gas is, kind of, I'm not going to cover it in this talk, but it's kind of a theme and that is taking over. It's just a lot more economical. And if you're a utility company uh, in the United States, you'll put a natural gas plant long before you'll put in a coal plant. So I don't, I believe that, that, that uh, coal, well, I think all fossil fuels will be a blip in human history, but I think coal in particular will be short lived. Okay, so now I'm gonna switch to petroleum. I guess I scared everybody else from making comments. <laughs> you guys can't can interrupt me if you want to interject a point. It doesn't have to be all me talking. Um, all right, petroleum. So, um, so like the last section, I'm going to talk about first where it came from, and so a little story. So, um, I don't remember a lot from grade school, but when I was in grade school, we we did actually surprisingly cover uh, coal and oil. And the teacher said, well, coal comes from down trees. And then she said, so class, can you guess where oil comes from? It says, well, oil is a lot more rare than coal. So oil comes from dinosaur bones, which is totally untrue. And it's, it's funny that I remember, I just thought it was funny that she would say that. So uh, where does oil come from? Um, it, it's really the same story as with coal, except it's in the ocean. So instead of these trees and plants falling, it's marine life that fell in the ocean about the same time period of 30 to 40 million years ago that marine life and uh, plants, uh, marine plants built up on the floor. And, and, and again, we have this, you know, sand silt gets on top of it, it gets pushed down, it gets compressed, heat and temperature, and there's a lot going on that eventually causes it to form oil. Now, having said that, it's interesting, you know, I, I think coal is very well understood, but for, at least from my, when I read uh, the science of this, that the, all the connecting all the dots of how you go from, uh, from marine life to petroleum is still not fully understood today by geologists and chemists. Now, maybe someone else, I've got this exercise for the reader icon here, maybe someone else would give a talk and explain it better to me. But from what I read online, it seems like there's still some uncertainties of how this process exactly occurs. And in fact, you know, years ago, it's, it's not popular now, there was actually an inorganic theory of petroleum that uh, oil was formed and, and kind of in the formation of the Earth's crust. It wasn't from marine life at all. It was part of the Earth's crust. And then there were, you know, there was some evidence just to, to back up that theory. It's not, I don't think it's widely believed today, but, you know, and there's been some disputes over it. Okay, well, where is petroleum found? I really like the, the chart I showed last time of coal showing the Pacific areas. And unfortunately for the next two topics, I couldn't get as nice of a map. So rather than showing the specific areas, it's just showing the countries where petroleum is found. And, you know, I don't think there's any surprises in this map. If you look at this, you know, you see Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, uh, Iran, Iraq, Canada, Russia, are the main countries that provide petroleum today. 
Okay, and then uh, what what do we use it for? Again, I'm going to follow the same pattern in each section. So um, we convert petroleum into gasoline, jet fuel, and diesel fuel. And actually, I was surprised. Nine percent goes to jet fuel. I, I didn't realize we consume so much uh, oil in jet fuel. But these are intermediates. So so maybe what I'm trying to lead to is instead not so much what do we, what chemicals do we turn it into, but what do we use it for? Like I did, like in coal, we talked about it was used for electricity. Not surprisingly, with petroleum, what do we use petroleum for? Well, we all know what we use petroleum for. We use petroleum in our cars. So this pie chart is showing uh, transportation is 65% uh, of the wedge here of the pie, right? Passenger travel is 47%, freight is 18%, that's 65%. And then, you know, there's some other things we use it for, heating, but, but really when you think of oil, not surprisingly, think of cars, right? Okay, so, um, I said maybe uh, we'll see whether you invite me back again, because uh, I am kind of going to go into a rabbit hole here. So in coal, I said we had 357 years of, of coal supply. How much oil do we have? How many years of oils do we have? And this is kind of a pet topic of mine. So um, I don't know how many of you have heard of this. There's this notion of peak oil that was really popular in the early 2000s. And the guy that came up with this is Marion King Hubert really bright guy, in 1958, he came up with this theory of peak oil and basically said that oil production would follow a bell-shaped curve that we're showing here. That, And this is the point of peak oil. This is the point where we produce the maximum amount of petroleum per year. And after that, we're going to produce less of it. And you know, you, at this point, you're discovering more and more uh, oil reserves. And of course, you're still discovering, but you're consuming more and more oil as well. So at some point, you're, you're consuming more than you're discovering and it's going to drop off. And, and he predicted we'd reach peak oil in the year 2000. Now, when he wrote this in 1958, that didn't cause all that much of a stir. Maybe it was still too far off for people to get too worried. But in 1998, two scientists had an article in Scientific American, and their article was the end of cheap oil. And, you know, these, these are two bright guys as well. And I think Scientific American is a pretty reputable uh, magazine. It's not like FizzRev Letters or something like that, but I think it's reputable. And they had you know, a fair amount of data in their articles showing the annual production of oil in different regions. And they had an article showing how the oil reserves were growing and how much we we're doing discoveries. But you know, their conclusion is really this, this point here, global production of conventional oil will begin to decline sooner than most people think, probably within 10 years. Well, here we are sitting in 2020, uh, 22 years later, and with hindsight, you know, we can just say how wrong they were, right? So let's look at the data that shows that. So this is showing oil production in the United States. Um, and uh, you, you could argue there was a peak. There was a peak in about 1970. And then, uh, and then oil production went down. And their article came about 2000. And, but in about 2010 or so, fracking came about and oil sands. And so actually production in the United States it, it didn't follow that bell curve, it went up a lot. And if you look, that's just the United States. Now let's look worldwide. So if you look worldwide, this is production of, of crude oil. And you see, you know, you don't even see that there's a little dip in 1978, but this curve continues going up and up and, and we haven't reached peak oil yet, at least as far as we know, unless it starts going down tomorrow. And in fact, in uh, 2014 to 2018, there was actually a, a glut of oil. So, so far from this, this dire uh, prediction that, that we would run out of oil, right? That hasn't been the case at all. So like I said, this is, this is kind of a pet topic of mine. And I've actually thought about writing a book or something, a blog on, on, on they were wrong. And um, so again, I'm going to continue talking down this rabbit hole. So uh, we just talked about peak oil, right? And I showed you how these expert scientific folks were wrong. Other examples that come to mind, um, I don't know, how many of you, uh, this may be a little touchy, coronavirus. Do you guys remember hearing in March of this year how many experts told us that a coronavirus vaccine was going to be years away? I mean, I heard that. I, I don't know if many of you other, but I heard a lot of experts saying it was going to take years for us to make a coronavirus vaccine, which is clearly not the case, obviously, as we know today, fortunately, thank God. Um, 
population bomb. This is something in the 1970s, 1980s. Uh, Ehrlich, a professor at Stanford in biology, uh, again, a really bright guy, had this, this book and he was on Johnny Carson. He's talking about how there's going to be starvation, our population is growing too fast, the food supply can't keep up. In the year 2000, it's going to be disaster and we have to take all this, this action. So I think these are three examples where I think scientists. I would say that the kind of to generalize this, that they, they underestimated the free market system, the power of economics, how much that can drive, the, the gloom induced scenarios did not come true. You know, other examples are kind of a joke, you know, killer bees, Y2K, those didn't come to happen. And, you know, kind of what this is leading up to is uh, global warming, right? So, you know, I, I, like I think all of you, I hope most of you do believe that global warming is real. Um, but I would say I, I can understand why a number of people in the population are skeptical of science. I don't think we have the, the best reputation necessarily with these doom and gloom scenarios. And so, I mean, there's scientists on this call, uh, mostly entirely. And I, I think maybe some humility at our standpoint and, and really making sure of our facts before we make bold claims right now, because I think we have hurt ourselves in the past and, and I think global warming is not as well accepted. Okay, so I'll get off the soapbox there, uh, that thing. And uh, so let me see if I can answer the question of how long our oil reserves will last. And I'm a little bit cautious, cautious about that after having lambasted these other people for being such idiots. So I will just quote uh, British Petroleum. Uh, British Petroleum says our oil reserves will last 53 years at our current rate of consumption. You know, and, and the thing about that is though, well, you know, it, it depends of course on what the price for oil is, right? So I'm showing here a chart of uh, price for oil per barrel inflation adjusted from 1919 up to 2019. And you can see for many years, the price was under $20, $20 a barrel, but at times the price went up to $120 a barrel and things like oil sands certainly becomes a lot more viable at $120 a barrel than it does at $20 a barrel. So how much our reserves last uh, really depends on, on what the price is gonna be. Okay, so, you know, in the last um, uh, section on coal, uh, I showed that nice graph showing how I thought that uh, uh, coal consumption was going was to drop off around 2030. We'd kind of reach the peak and we're going to use more. So what about petroleum? How much petroleum are we going to use in the future? And, you know, if you looked at this chart of what we use petroleum for, as I said, two thirds of it is for vehicles. And of course, the big trend that's happening is electric vehicles. So I, I looked it up currently about 2.6% of sales of vehicles today are electric vehicles. And the claim is 1% of the stock of the cars that are on the road are electric vehicles. So honestly, that seems a little bit high to me, but, but, but obviously there is a big trend that more and more electric vehicles are taking over. So that might argue that our petroleum consumption is going to drop significantly in the future. And unfortunately, I, I would like to have an answer. I don't have an answer for this. This is a big exercise for the reader. I, I literally spent about two hours researching this to try and figure out if someone could predict how much petroleum we're going to use in the future, giving these factors. I couldn't find it. So I'm sorry, I kind of failed you on that. And maybe someone else could give a talk in the future who knows this better than I am about how much petroleum we're going to use in the future, because I don't know. Okay, so uh, the remaining time in this talk, I'm gonna talk about nuclear energy and I'm going to continue sharing my opinions, I guess, whether you agree with them or not. Um, so uh, just to stir things up here. Um, so I've got two pictures here. On the left is Diablo Canyon, no nukes rally in 1981. And on the right is a global warming protest in 2019. So a few observations about these, you know, you know, is it just me or does it seem like the kind of people that are in this no nukes rally are the same kind of people that we're seeing in this global warming protest in 2019? I think there are similar kinds of environmentally concerned people that would be in both of these kind of rallies. And it's ironic because there are some preeminent climate scientists today that are concerned about global warming that are saying, you know, you know that that thing we protested about 40 years ago about nuclear power. You know, well, you know, 
maybe, maybe actually nuclear power is the solution to the problem we're facing today with global warming, right? Which is pretty ironic. And the other thing, you know, and I, I guess when you get older, um, it's easy to look back at how great life was in the past when you were younger. So I'm going to do some of that, you know. Okay, so a nuclear power plant goes, goes bad and 5,000, 10,000 people die. That, that is certainly a tragedy, and I don't want to make that seem insignificant. But compared to, the, to, to possibly the Earth reaching a tipping point and life stopping not existing on Earth, you know, I would love to have the problem of, uh, of a nuclear power plant uh, possibly uh, having a disaster rather than global warming, right? So I'd say those were the good old days when we could protest about nuclear power. Okay, a little bit of physics. And uh, so I know there are a number of scientists that know this very well. And I had trouble trying to figure out how to pitch this talk because I don't want to be condescending. So many of people have seen this many times before, but there are a few people on here that haven't seen this. So I'm going to kind of walk through this. So this chart is showing about how the whole universe is moving to iron. Uh, iron is the low energy state. So on the vertical axis, really, you can see this is energy. And this is how heavy the atom is. So there are two processes, fission and fusion. And so fission, you take a heavy atom like uranium. And uranium can split into smaller uh, smaller atoms, and as it splits into smaller atoms, it undergoes fission and it releases, it, it releases obviously energy as we get in a nuclear fission plant. And you know that process can keep on going until eventually you get the iron and there's no place you can go. The other side of the curve is fusion. So obviously, for example, in the sun, we have hydrogen. Hydrogen does the opposite process. Two hydrogen atoms can fuse together to make a larger atom, helium. And again, it releases a lot of energy. And that process can continue uh, getting to more and more dense things. But eventually, it goes to iron. And there's, there's, there's no other place to go. So I'm going to talk uh, about fission first and then fusion. So yeah, let's start with fission. All right, so I'm, I'm going to make this uh, intentionally uh, opaque statement here and then explain it. My statement is fission doesn't come from fusion. And so uh, let's, let's take coal, for example. So where does coal get its energy from? Well, coal, the energy is tied up in these, these carbon bonds, and then we, we burn the coal and we make CO2. And how are those carbon bonds formed? Those carbon bonds were formed through photosynthesis in the plants. Uh, where did the plants get that energy from? The plants got their energy from sunlight and sunlight comes from the sun. And where does the sun get its energy from? The sun gets its energy from nuclear fusion inside of the core of the sun. So I would argue that coal, petroleum, natural gas, wind and solar, Really, these things, you know, if you look at their source, they are, they are powered by fusion, by fusion inside of the sun's core. However, that's not the case for uranium-235, which, which I think is really interesting. Where does uranium-235 come from? Well, there are a couple of theories, but basically anything heavier than lead predates the existence of our solar system. Um, so, we believe that, and I think maybe there was a talk on this that I missed, unfortunately, and I tried to find YouTube but couldn't find it. But anyway, we believe that anything heavier than lead either comes from the explosion of a supernova that blew off the, the, outer, uh, the outer layers of the sun when it went supernova, and that caused these heavier, heavier elements. Or there's a theory that two neutron stars collided and the gravitational forces involved in that collision created everything, all these elements heavier than lead, those elements then got dispersed through a large region of space billions of years ago. And then when our solar system formed, I think uh, maybe it's 4 billion years ago. Anyway, when our solar system formed, these remnants from prior supernovas or from uh, neutron star collisions then coalesced into our sun, into our earth. And so, um, so, so, so uranium, uh, which I think is interesting, predates the existence of our solar system. OK, well, where is the uranium found? Um, uh, so again, I'm trying to show a map of the places of the Earth where it's found. Uranium is found in Canada, United States, Russia, 
and Australia and some in Kazakhstan and a few other places, right? It's, it's spread pretty far over around. Uranium is what, a metal? Yeah. You're, you're, you're not muted. You have a question? No. Okay, I'm going to go on. If you could mute, Diana. Um, all right, so um, what is uranium used for? So, you know, another case I showed a pie chart we talked about in coal, it was electricity and with petroleum, it was cars. Well, I know uranium is used for weapons and electricity generation, but um, unfortunately I only have this candy bar chart because uh, I, I couldn't find the answer to, to uh, you know, what percent of uranium goes for weapons and what goes for commercial reactors. I suspect that, that that information is classified. People don't want us to know how much uranium is produced for weapons. I don't know, I, I couldn't find it. So I, I don't know. I know it's in those two categories and really not for much else, but, uh, but the specifics I'm, I'm unaware of. All right, how much uranium do we have? Well, it turns out we have quite a bit of uranium. Uranium is, uh, is uh, 40 times more common than silver. The Nuclear Energy Ener Agency estimates that for the economically accessible uranium resources, we, we have about a 200 year supply at the current rate of consumption. But it gets far better than that. It turns out uranium is in seawater and it's not economically viable at this point to extract uranium from seawater, but we have demonstrated it's possible. And so we believe if we extract uranium from seawater, we have a 60,000 year supply of uranium. So we are not, you know, the energy sources, uranium's way ahead in energy density and it's way ahead as far as supply, 60,000 year supply. A little bit about the physics goes on with uh, nuclear fission. I think, again, I'm not trying to be condescending. I think a lot of you are aware of this, but uranium-235, you hit it with a neutron and uh, it undergoes fission. You make a number of different elements. I've got some down here. I iodine, cesium, strontium, whatever, uh, that are produced. And when it does that, two things happen. It releases energy, which is what we want. And uh, even better, we then produce three more high energy neutrons. And this is where we get the chain reaction part that these neutrons then go on to hit your other uranium-235 nuclei. And this process continues, uh, continues on either to make a bomb or you can control it, in which case it's a nuclear fission reactor. There are 440 reactors worldwide. USA has the most of them. You know, there are a lot of fastening variants in the different kinds of reactors. I think it would be an interesting talk just to talk about the different kinds of reactors, light, heavy water, et cetera. I'm not gonna go into all these, but there are a lot of neat different kinds of, of fission reactors. Uh, local, local angle, there's a company called uh, New Scale. Maybe some of you've heard of micronuclear reactors is really a trending thing and New Scale, which is in Tigard, Oregon, and they also are in Corvallis. They're trying to make these really small nuclear reactors. They're about the size of a, uh, of a storage container, you know, one of these, uh, you know, the trucks are carrying down the road. Um, now, I don't think it's a panacea for the nuclear industry. It seems like the market that it's really well suited for is if you're in a remote village in Alaska where it's difficult to get power, that it's really attractive to have this trailer size micro nuclear reactor. Or if the Department of Defense and you're invading Afghanistan and you need to power your base, that's really attractive. But personally, I don't think that these micro nuclear reactors are gonna be spread throughout the United States and used, uh, used a lot. But I could be wrong, and I think you know that would be a great talk if someone want to talk about micronuclear reactors and how they're going to do. Okay, will we have more reactors? I'm going to predict the future again, my own opinion, which you may not agree with, but I'm going to walk through it. So, pluses for nuclear energy: uh, no greenhouse gases, and you know that 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 really is a big deal, right? I mean, zero. It's fantastic, right? Infinite supply. Well, pretty close to infinite supply well developed we've been making nuclear reactors for many years they're reliable and they're non-varying you know non-varying is really a big deal you know there's a lot of uh, interest in uh, wind energy right and wind energy can be very economical when the wind is blowing however you have to back up a wind farm with a coal-fired uh, plant for when the wind isn't blowing then wind energy isn't as cheap as as you might think and again i hope to talk about this in the, in the next talk i give so anyway those, those those are some of the pluses 
And I'm going to throw out as well, excellent safety record, which, you know, may seem surprising to people given Chernobyl and stuff like that. Uh, but when you compare it to fossil fuels, particularly to coal, like I said, coal is so dirty. And what we do our atmosphere and the people that die from that, you know, it's not even close. That nuclear energy is, is very safe compared to the alternatives. Minuses. Okay. So, uh, you know, this is, this is probably, this is a big one expensive to build and operate. So, I mean, it just goes down to economics, right? A nuclear power plant, it costs a lot of money to build one. And, and then even worse, it's, it's, it's expensive. It's more expensive to operate than the alternative. So if you're a uh, utility company in the United States, you're gonna go with natural gas. It's a lot cheaper to build and operate. Now, natural gas is, is 50%, as far as greenhouse gases, is 50% better than coal which okay it's good it's still not great though right i'm not i'm not i mean i'd rather see us go to more nuclear but uh but it is expensive um everything with with uh with nuclear reactors is fukushima right and uh, you know these next two examples i think are more political but uh it's really damning for the nuclear industry to have a first world plus country like japan have a nuclear reactor disaster, right? I mean, it's, 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 it's horrible for the industry. So Japan has 54 nuclear reactors. Only nine have been brought back online in 2011. And, and of the remainder, 24 of the reactors are gonna be decommissioned. So I'm not gonna say that's a death knell, but that is really a bad thing for, for the industry. But I think it's more political. Nuclear waste comes up and nuclear waste is a real issue. Um, you know, the, after you have this spent uranium fuel, the half-life, the primary components, the half-life is decades, but there's these transuranic uh, elements that have half-lives of centuries to thousands of years. So the nuclear waste is a real issue. This is again, in my opinion, kind of more of a political issue though. So the problem in the US, we, we built Yucca Mountain. I think it was several billion dollars. I'm going to say 13 billion. I don't remember what it cost. Yucca Mountain is this facility in Nevada that we put to store nuclear waste so all the commercial sites could send their nuclear waste there and could be stored. Uh, however, I think a case of NIMBY, not in my backyard, the politicians in Nevada put a requirement that, that for Yucca Mountain, they had to have an environmental impact report that showed that Yucca Mountain would be stable for 1 million years which just isn't realistic and possible to, to show. So Yucca Mounda, which has been built, is not being used now. And so in the United States, um, the nuclear waste is still being stored on site at the nuclear plants. And some of these plants are running out of room, right? So again, if you're, if you're a utility company in the United States and you're trying to figure out with we, what, what you're going to do with the nuclear waste, you're probably going to uh, build a natural gas plant. Now, new plants are being built. Um, China and Russia are building plants. And I think, you know, I would argue that they don't have uh, as much issue with these political uh, concerns that I listed there. And, you know, to me, it's like good for them. I think, you know, we showed how many uh, coal plants that uh, China is continuing to use. Wouldn't, wouldn't we rather China put a lot more nuclear plants in? I think it'd be a lot better for, uh, for, for the world, for the environment if they did it. So I, I wish them success. But I'm not all that uh, hopeful, at least right now, until we get through these political issues for the United States, it's gonna be a lot more nuclear reactors. Okay, and then the last thing I'm gonna talk about is nuclear fusion. So again, a little bit about the physics. So um, in the sun, two hydrogen atoms come together and they form helium. Now it turns out the activation energy is a lot less if you use isotopes of hydrogen, you use deuterium and tritium and uh, you get helium and, this, and, a, and a neutron that pops out. And kind of what's going on here, I'm showing the forces here, you've got an electrostatic force. You've got this tritium and deuterium and they're positively charged and positive charges do not want to get next to each other. So the electrostatic force is going to push them away. But at some point they get close enough, and that's what I'm showing here, the strong nuclear force then takes over. So these two atoms are going to fight, fight against each other, fight against each other, and they'll get close enough, and then wham, they are going to come together and they're going to stay together. And you're going to get helium, and then you'll get this high energy neutron that's going to pop out. And that high energy neutron is what you're going to use to heat water that will then run a turbine and stuff like that, much like in a nuclear uh, fission plant. 
Fusion facts and status. So uh, methods for fusion, uh, there's the tokamak, which is probably the best known uh, they're building. There's a facility, I think it's in France, ITER, uh, they're building it. It uses these superconducting cooled magnets to confine a plasma that's then brought to temperatures of like 400,000 degrees and then it's confined and that uh, that that heat and uh, confinement is enough to cause the the atoms to, to join together and fuse the other uh, technique that's uh, that's being investigated is inertial confinement where uh, that's what I'm showing here where you kind of drop these uh, pellets in and these pellets fall in and then they get hit with uh, with a whole bunch of lasers and the lasers uh, heat up and compact in and cause the fusion to occur. There, there are a lot of other variants. And again, you could do a whole talk on you know, different methods for, for fusion. Positives of nuclear fusion. Well, it's certainly green. Um, there's no, there's no uh, CO2 made. It's less radioact less radio radioactivity than in fission. There's there's a little bit, but there's there's very little. You don't have the risks. There's no meltdown. You know, can't can't run away if a, if, a, if a fusion reactor. It's just not possible for it to. to, to the hard part is to get it to happen. Getting it to run away is not going to happen. Unlimited supply. Yeah, there is unlimited supply. Although I'll say tritium is not quite as as unlimited. Uh, there's no weapons material. So, you, you know, a terrorist can't pull up to a nuclear fusion plant and at gunpoint, you know, walk away with, with hydrogen. They're not going to do anything to make a weapon. So, so that's, that's great as well. Negatives, however, there are a lot of negatives. So, so tritium is, is expensive and not as available. So, so you get to this economics. And, and, and economics, the bigger thing is just reactors are, are expensive. You know, as I said, nuclear fission reactors are expensive to operate. A nuclear fusion, it's going to be, it's going to make a fission reactor look like a child's toy, right? I mean, either these laser beams or these superconducting magnets and these massive facilities, you know, this is an engineering project, you know, I wouldn't say the scale we've never heard of before, but it is a really a big deal. These hydrogen neutrons that are released, they can degrade the surrounding materials, so, so you have worry about degrading and or shielding. And nuclear fusion is just hard. So, you know, it didn't take that long when we discovered fission to, to make a fission reactor, but nuclear fusion, we, research began in the 1940s, uh, quite a while ago. No system has generated a net electricity. They have done fusion, but it's always taken more energy in than they've gotten out. The US has spent $30 billion since 1953 investigating nuclear fusion. And they're going to spend another forty billion dollars on a demo. Well, this is not just U.S., but another forty billion dollars will be spent on on, on demonstrating commercial reactor. So, um, you know, this begs the question of: Is this where we best spend our money? I mean, could you instead spend that money looking at you know, better solar panels or geothermal or tidal or all these other sources of energy, or should we continue to invest in fusion in the hopes of a big payoff? Now. I'm not going to answer that question. There are a lot of pluses and minuses. I mean, if you compare it to the cost of a B-1 bomber, you'd say, well, you know, it's not so expensive. But we compare it to some of these other energy uh, sources we could we could study. Um, it's not clear. And so, rather than answer that question, I'm going to end this talk with a joke. And I know many of you guys have heard this joke, but a few of you have not. So, for those that have not, I'm going to share this joke. Uh, so this guy's walking through. Uh, the desert in the Middle East, and uh, and he kicks an oil lamp, and as we would all expect, out comes a genie, and the genie says, I'll grant you one wish. And the guy reaches into his back pocket, and he has a map, and he pulls out the map, and he gives it to the, to the genie, and it's a map of the Middle East, and he says, yeah, you know, for my one wish, I would like peace in this region of the world. And the genie looks at the map, and he looks at the guy, and he says, well, you know, uh, you're asking a lot here. We've got all these different religions and different economics and poorly defined boundaries and thousands of years of fighting. And, you know, I mean, he says, that's just really difficult. He says, is, is there anything else I, I could, that I could give you as, as your wish instead? And um, the guy thinks for a second, he says, well, he says, yeah, come to think of it. How about if instead you make tokamak fusion uh, economically viable? 
And the genie looks at the guy and he thinks for a minute or so and he says, can I see that map again? Okay, so that's it. So uh, questions or comments from the field? Or I guess they could. John, we, we, we can't hear you. Let, let me offer a comment or two, if I may. At first, it was a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. I mean, just, just wonderful. Let me make just a, I mean, you're stressing the role of economics, which is interesting. And I think you could actually say that, that once electric cars become cheaper, according to some appropriate metric, they'll just displace gasoline cars because the reliability is, is far higher. And the relevant metric, again, is a, to my mind, is a, is a price scale metric that, that if I'm not concerned with paying the upfront cost or I have really good credit, they're cheaper now. If I'm one of these people who has horrendous credit or can't pay the upfront cost or is buying a 10-year-old car, they're more expensive. The other comment that's not made about nuclear is that many of the disasters were really human caused. And I think one can look back to the aircraft industry for lessons. Uh, those who are old and black hair like me <laughs> may remember that uh, the aircraft industry got worried that a host of crashes were going to make people unwilling to fly. And, and there were also things due to human error. I, at that point was doing a certain amount of commuting New York to Atlanta. And uh, one of them, I think uh, the airport was basically <laughs> waving everyone off and Eastern said, yeah, we can bring the plane into Kennedy and it crashed. And that was essentially the end of, of Eastern Airlines. So the French have provided a model for nuclear power where there are a few standard reactors that are built as opposed to here where everyone is a unique design and then I think the last thing that one wants to look at is let's imagine that you were head of uh, Tokyo Electric and Power, which ran uh, Fukushima Daiichi. And you're saying, well, I'm likely to be in office for 10 years and the chance of a magnitude nine earthquake occurring in the next 10 years is, I don't know, 5%, 2%, whatever. It, I will earn a lot more money and the company will be a lot more profitable when I'm there if I don't protect against it. Because had they simply built their backup generators so that they wouldn't be taken out in a tsunami, which might be expected, they could have shut it down. I mean, it, there, there's a whole host of engineering knowledge about which I think many people in this audience know far, far more than I do that, that just could go in and suddenly uh, you're, you're there on, on nuclear, at least as a, as a solution, say bridging the gap till we've uh, achieved some other ways to, to, to limit global warming. And when I teach climate change at Simon's Rock, I tend to get students involved in debate, pro or con nuclear as an interim step. But you know, I like your point that it's it's enormously safer than 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 anything. And if the public even understood, uh, gee, I build a coal plant, and the pollution from the coal plant right. kills far more people than we're ever lost in Three Mile Island or on Rico Fermi in Detroit or whatever. But thanks a lot. It was really great. I mean, it was just. Just Thank you. No, and you know, I would comment more. I think you have valid points. Like I said, I'm not an expert either, so I'm not going to debate it. But yeah, I think I, I mostly agree with you. Yeah. Uh, Carol, I, 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 I have. Well, if I could add to that. Uh, yeah. Go ahead. I, I'm. I'm sorry. Uh, no. Go ahead. Um, one of the <laughs> things I'd like to say is that uh, um, there are a couple of stories out there about the power of the NRC versus the industry. And 
What's interesting is, is that while the NRC has been very forward thinking in safety, the industry just hasn't. Uh, everything that costs the industry money has been resisted. And with that in mind, um, Scott, if you look at the cost of, of uh, nuclear versus the cost of renewables uh, yeah. in terms of solar and uh, wind, not much different. I mean, the idea is, is uh, by the time you clean up these nuclear plants and dispose of the waste, which we've been unable to completely, you know, to do it all is kind of remarkable. But my dad worked for the power company uh, back in the 60s and 70s. And he actually built a house that had all electric heat because at that time they were saying that electricity was going to be free. Yeah. Nuclear <laughs> energy was going to be so cheap that electricity will be free. And so they went all out and, and built all these electric heated houses with lots of insulation and all that. And we, we can see how far that's gone. Um, so yeah. one of the interesting things is I, I've seen the, the calculations that is solar panels and uh, wind farms get cheaper and cheaper, even though there is this lag with storage. It seems likely that nuclear will just never compete for cost ever again for the uh, cost of construction and decommissioning and cleaning up. I, and I'm pro-nuclear, but I, I just think the money isn't there. So that's, that's it. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. The problem with electric cars is where do you get the electricity from? Okay, it's not self-generating it. It comes from another source that becomes, goes into that battery. And so that's an issue that some people have. I'd love to have an electric car and there are people I know who do have it, but that's a big issue. And the other thing that it, the uh, local Con Edison plant is now building storage for these enormous batteries that they can use, they say, and they show pictures of the people that work in there they will use that the batteries as backup when they need more energy than they can provide from their usual sources um but then you have to think okay but what powers the batteries that they're storing uh and one one just one thing david and i were doing a river cruise in france and I was rather surprised that as you're cruising along, there are these giant power plants right, right by you, right? You're going up, you know, you're being lifted up and you see, oh, look, there's a power plant right there. You know, you hope France has got a better handle than other people did. Maybe. Yeah, I rode my bike through France and I, I was struck by the number of power plants as well. I understand some of it is, is historical that they didn't want, you know, in World War II, they got their energy from Germany and they had this real push for independence. But I, I mm -hmm. guess to some of your questions, yes, electricity, electric cars, really good. Now, after one of the talks, someone looked up for Oregon, uh, we get a lot of our electricity from renewable sources, but clearly if you're powering your electric car from a coal fired plant, that's not the way to do it, right? No, but one couldn't imagine, and, and, you know, kind of my next talk, I'll talk about renewable and, energy storage, you know, Tesla's selling these solar panels and local battery storages. Is, is it a centralized or is it decentralized? There's there's a lot going on there. And I, I don't think we know the answer, but I, I think that's a fair, fair point. Now you mentioned in on one of your charts, you briefly have a thing that shows fracking. And I don't know if you're gonna get into that again, but fracking is a big issue. I that people are, are resisting because it is causing damage. It's probably causing minor earthquakes in places that never had them before. And so fracking is not something we can just glibly say, oh, good, you know, let's go ahead and use it. Yeah, I, I didn't open that can of worms. I think. I think yes, you did. Uh, <laughs> well, I mentioned it, but I didn't, you know, I, I think to your point, it would be great if someone gave a talk on just fracking, because like you said, there are a lot of aspects of fracking. It's, it would be yes. a talk in its own. And I, I personally, I'd love to hear someone give a talk on that. I think there's um, no free lunch. Can I add you something? Take your I risk and live with it. And, 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 and fracking is 
say that again? I didn't hear you. Could you get closer to the mic, Booker? I, I'm just saying that, that there's no free lunch. You, you take your risk and you live with it and you minimize it. But to say, gee, we can't have fracking because there were minor earthquakes or water pollution or whatever. Well, you compared said to, like said, to coal mining and the number of miners, in fact, that die every year from the mining itself, never mind all of the other environmental effects. Uh, right. You had, uh, let me just nitpick one little thing. You had, you had that table on where you were dissing on clean coal. Yes. And you had coal washing. Well, the coal yeah. washing only reduces the ash and the sulfur. It has nothing to do with, with the yeah. quality of the, the carbon in the, in the coal. Uh, so the sulfur gets burned and is that, is, is the sulfur if you burning don't, bad? If, if you don't clean it, you're going to burn the sulfur and then you've got to put in a scrubber. Or if you're working with, uh, Trump rules, then you get away with letting the, the SO2 and the mercury out, <laughs> out, out the stack. That's right. Okay. Thank you. Hey, I, I just like to say, uh, Scott, I'm, I'm sorry, um, Mr. Brooks. Uh, Tim Wensley used to work in the, the nuclear industry, so I think he, he wanted to have to say something. Yeah, I was just going to say it was interesting. I went to work in the nuclear industry in 1975, and uh, we were selling power plants like crazy. Um, the order board is filling up and then I was still in the nuclear industry at Three Mile Island. And it was so interesting because for days we had all these teams trying to figure out what happened and nobody knew what happened until we finally realized that there was hydrogen explosion that had occurred and all the nuclear physicists had no idea what was creating hydrogen. Um, and then all of those orders started to rapidly start to be canceled. And it really became down to a corporate risk issue, I think, of, yeah. you know, why would you spend 10 years or 12 years to build a nuclear power plant when you could create a gas plant in two years? And so it was a risk avoidance strategy more than a technological issue, I think, because it was just the unknowns were just unmountable at that point the political risk to the utilities just became too large and do you think that's that's uh history now do you, do you think there are no longer those technical risks do you think there are I there really don't, i really don't know you know oh. um, i haven't worked in the nuclear industry for so many years but i think at that point you know those unknowns struck everybody um everybody in the industry you know, people were walking around the hallways wondering what, what had happened and forming groups to chat about it because the industry itself didn't know what was happening. This is where France has a bit of an advantage in that they have some standardized designs so that if you had this problem at Three Mile Island, it would immediately be circulated to everyone else running the same thing so they can learn from it. And I think one of the problems we've had, as I understand it, my father was in uh, design, reactor designer at Brookhaven Lab, so I've a bit of familial experience. But uh, uh, the, the, the US reactors are frequently highly sighted uh, adapted. They're more or less one-offs. And so it's hard you know, someone will train to operate <clears throat> on ed and and their experience, their knowledge can't be used for Vermont Yankee, which has been supplying a lot of our power here. Uh, I don't know if that's that much true. I, I mean, the pressurizer in that case, which is basically the equivalent of you know, on your home furnace that regulates the amount of water versus um, that there's an air bubble that keeps uh, the water pressure in nobody understood a little bit like the 737s with the two sensors. Nobody knew that the pressurizer had drained because the sensor failed. And so it was once again, a, a mechanical failure and everybody misinterpreted the results from that mechanical failure. So then when that steam bubble was created within the reactor because the pressurizer had, had basically gone solid that the uh, hydrogen bubble formed, which then when the pressure release valves occurred, the hydrogen was released into the containment 
and then there was an explosion. But the yeah. big thing was nobody knew, I don't think, to be honest with you, that the reaction process would then create that hydrogen. Yeah, but, but, but now the question is transferring that knowledge everywhere. And the other part that wasn't realized about Three Mile Island, I mean, you're familiar with it far more than I am, is the actual danger it posed to the public was very, very small. It was. I mean, it, it, it's, we as scientists, and I include myself in this group, have not done a good job of, exp of explaining to everyone that th this question of risks. You know, uh, an airplane crashes, the 100 or 200 people on it, that's a major tragedy. Auto accidents in the US kill 100 a day every single day. And we can't get decent anti-drunk driving rules, for example. Oh, I, I'm not arguing that point, but I, I was more arguing the point of the unknown that occurred. Yeah. Because it wasn't known until quite a few years later that there really was a meltdown that was melting through the bottom of that reactor. I was involved with building the first camera systems that went in and looked at those reactors. And um, everybody was shocked to find that the fuel had really had melted down. Everybody assumed it was still in its original configuration, but it, it was melting through the bottom of that reactor. It didn't continue all the way through, but the process had started. Yeah. So yeah. if that problem had occurred as it was, it took days to really figure out what to do. But if it would have occurred for a few more days, it could have been more catastrophic. Mm. I have a comment. <laughs> uh, first of all, in what year was the last nuclear plant built in the United States? The last one that was it's it's at least 30 years ago, isn't it? And while you're thinking about that, <laughs> I, I don't know the answer to that I did. I did see new plants are happening in, like I said, in other places of the world, uh, maybe. Some right. Places. Yeah. Isn't there one in Savannah, that Georgia, that's going to be completed? Does know. anyone know about that? I don't, I don't know. But I have a comment about your Y2K example of, of how the predictors were wrong. Yeah, right. uh, I've always taken that as a great example of how organizations react to a prediction and then by taking uh, important actions, specific actions, to counteract what's supposedly going to happen, they stop it from happening. And so that I don't think is a good example of where they were wrong. They were right that there would have been a catastrophe if nobody paid attention to the prediction that there would be a catastrophe. Okay, now that sounds like a great debate. That would be another good talk. <laughs> uh, I, I understand. So I, you know, I used to have acid rain on. Was acid rain overhyped, or did we deal with acid rain and it went away? You know, because of the reaction, similar to Y two K. And I think Y two K, there was a lot of. Pre I think part of this is the press loves disasters, and they give they give massive amount of coverage Absolutely. to it. I yeah. personally don't believe Y two K would have been the disaster that it was forecast. I mean, maybe we have difference of opinion. You think we took all the appropriate actions. I don't know, you know. Um, uh, so one of my friends who's on this call worked with IBM and and they were carrying around satellite phones to, to, to uh, at, at, you know, at that time, the year 2000 to deal with this, this upcoming disaster. And it obviously it didn't happen at the level, but uh, they're differing opinions. I agree with you on that. I agree, that we, I agree to, to differ maybe, but I think it'd be a great talk. I have a question for, for, for somebody that might have the answer to this. You know, we, we keep talking about how, storing the energy. What happens if there's a leak at Yucca or a leak at the storage facilities in Utah? What, what is the result there if you have a, a, a really bad leak of that massive amount of nuclear waste? Anybody know? I don't know, but I know they have problems of storing this stuff in barrels and the barrels are degrading and leaking. And I personally think that that's the major problem with uh, fusion, uh, fission energy, 
Uh, I live in Colorado and they have uh, Rocky Flats where they were building uh, uh, atomic weapons. And uh, it was a super fun site and it was cleaned up and they opened it up to the public. And then right after they opened it up, somebody went there with a Geiger counter and then they had to close it again because it's still unacceptably radioactive. And when you have uh, elements that have, you know, half-lives of thousands of years, you've got a real problem if you get a lot of it. And um, somebody was talking about building plants in this country. My recollection is that Long Island Lighting, Wilco, built a plant out on Long Island and they never commissioned it. They finally abandoned it after spending billions of dollars to build it. And the people on Long Island are paying huge amounts of money for electricity because somebody's got to pay these billions of dollars that they've wasted. It was worse than that on sale because, I mean, I lived there. Uh, Lilco, when they tried, which was the utility, there was a rule that, for example, your backup power generator had to run 24 hours at 125% of the, the load that would, would be needed to, sh to shut it down, the reactor. They never got theirs to run more than six hours. They had welds fail. They were just, to my, in my unhumble opinion, a bunch of bumbling idiots. And then the question of who paid for it, they turned it on for one day. So it would be used and useful. They put a little power in and now decommissioning is extremely expensive compared to simply removing fuel rods where you've never had any fission. Uh, some of those people should have been given room and board at fine federal facilities. And, and if I can add, I think that's just an example of the kind of things that are, you know, some of it's political, some of it's overreaction, but uh, Yucca Mountain could have taken our waste. It's dry. It would have never, um, uh, basically, the uh, containers would not have decomposed, but people were saying, how are we going to tell generations 10 and 100,000 years out not to go there? And people were saying, we don't even know what language they're going to speak. And it, it just went on and on. I, I was involved in a lot of low-level nuclear waste um, disposal. And, um, you know, in, in, and what they wanted to do is have a lot of large compacts. And it just seems that, again, so much of the, uh, the removal of waste is more political than it is physical. We can do it. And right now we're just storing it all at these individual sites, which to me seems a recipe for disaster. We're storing high level radioactive waste in pools at individual generators and that's not an answer and we're not answering that question and i don't know how we can move forward until we do and just nobody's there so again i'm i'm all i'm pro nuclear i just don't think we can we can physically do it anymore with the politics and the costs and we need to look ahead and find other ways to generate electricity yeah, I'd like to add, my name is Tony Fresco uh, on that comment. Um, and if you talk about renewable energy, um, I, have a, I have two papers for the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. One of them dates back to 2010. The other one is somewhat more recent, 2016. I'll give you the title of the more recent one. It's called Solute Ion Linear Alignment as the Energy Source <coughs> to address aquifer depletion, freshwater scarcity, and sea level rise. Basically, what I've been doing, I have a patent. I'm working now with a professor from City College that I worked with in 2017. And uh, to make a long story short, it involves, we could get all the energy we want, as far as I'm concerned, from the salt and seawater. You just capture the ions. There's a process called capacitive deionization where all you're doing, you're putting 1.5 volts uh, across these two electrodes. The electrodes absorb, uh, you know, the positive electrode absorbs the negative ions, the negative electrode absorbs the positive ions, but then you add some additional electrodes and you can uh, uh, cause the, I, the ion, basically you're isolating 
the positive ions and the negative ions, and you're causing them to self-accelerate. You have a local excess of, of ions and charge. And so as far as I'm concerned, that's a renewable energy source. And um, it's, I can show you know, calculations that I have in the papers if anybody's interested. And if you'd like to, some more information for the next talk, I'd be glad to provide it. And I'm in the process of working on um, submitting something, hopefully, for the uh, Gates Foundation. They have something on small scale, uh, excuse me, smart farming innovations for small scale producers in uh, various countries in Africa and some parts of India. So that's my comment. Tony, how would you like to do a paper for, do a, do a talk for us uh, sometime? Yeah, I could do that. I, I did something uh, back in, um, a while ago in 2017. And if you're interested, I could certainly try to do that. Okay. Scott, I want to add a, a, a very late comment. I am, I live in Northern California. You talked about the increased use of natural gas, but um, in our local communities that I have to live in Palo Alto, all the cities are saying, forget about natural gas. We're going to get rid of it. We only want to rely on electricity. And I think that's um, a, I'm not sure how scientific that that position is. Can you get comment on that, please? Uh, well, when they said they want to rely on electricity, there are electricity plants that are powered by natural gas. So, um, so I'm not quite sure I get that right. I mean, I, I, I guess they're, they're not allowing any new homes to have any use of natural. Oh, oh gas. inside of their home. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yes. Well, I guess they're. Or, or, very, or commercial buildings. Yeah, I guess they're very optimistic about us getting all our electricity from uh, green sources in the future. That's, that, that's really expensive, <laughs> leaning forward, bold. Um, you know, this, to me, that's the typical Palo Alto, right? You know, um, <laughs> yeah. it, it's like the rest of the world couldn't imagine uh, doing that, but um, okay. It's it, it seems it's a very expensive undertaking. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah, very costly. Uh, maybe, maybe you know, maybe they're 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 in the vanguard, right? They're they're, maybe that's where we'll all be fifty years from now. I don't I know think, anybody else. I think them, they but, are. Yeah. Well, now you know why Elon Musk is moving to Texas. Yeah. <laughs> what about what about the example of of Germany? Germany, uh, they're decommissioning their nuclear power plants and and uh, going to a, a more green sources of energy, and it. From what I can see, it seems like it's, it's been pretty successful. Are you? Yeah, so that's kind of the next thing I want to talk about renewables. And I have heard, I guess I'd like to dig in more. So I've heard like at times people say Germany gets 45% of their energy from wind. Well, that's true some of the time. So when the wind's blowing, right? And the question is the rest of the time when the wind's not blowing, that's not an average, right? That's kind of a peak. Best case, they get 45% of their energy from wind. Now, it's, I was unaware that they were commissioning nuclear. So I think, uh, I think we will have to look into that. I, I, I don't know enough about that. There was an article in Scientific American about it. And uh, I think they're in within four years, they're going to be no nukes, no nuclear power yeah. in yeah. Germany. I mean, it's just an example of a, of a, of a is phasing out their nuclear plants. Yes. Right. So I mean, that's, that's just a, an interesting observation that here's a major country yeah. That's right. actually going right. that route. Right. And by the way, your comment on on the population bomb, when I was an undergraduate in college, that 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 book really made an impact on me. And uh, you're right; uh, most of the prognostications in that in that book have not come to fruition. There's a great Planet Money. I'll set the slides afterwards, and I'll put it in the slide. And there's a great Planet Money. If you guys ever listen to that podcast, where he made a bet with an economist that by the year 2000, all these uh, metals would be at a certain dollar price and he lost the bet on all of those. Right. It's interesting. Yeah, yeah I've, read, I've read several articles recently about huge advances, advances in battery design. In fact, there was an article recently about General Motors coming up with a, a battery, a lithium battery and pouches that are modular and uh, they're highly efficient. And I know that uh, Tesla is working on battery development. So we tend to evaluate things based upon the current technology, but
but that would be like saying, how, how can I have automobiles running on gasoline? There isn't enough gasoline in the world if everybody buys a car. And what happens is the economy adapts to the need. And I think that's gonna be true with the electricity also and the pollution. There's also another interesting thing with, between natural gas and renewable. Florida Power and Light is using focused sunlight to generate steam. Hmm. And, and then that's running essentially, I mean, a coal plant, a nuke plant, a gas plant, they're all steam engines essentially. You're converting right. your, your energy 